Everyone wanted to grab their seats. I think we're ready to start with the first panel. I don't have a school bell to ring. <coughs> so real quickly, uh, my name is Patrick Masson. I'm the uh, general manager and director of the Open Source Initiative. And I too, like Ian, would like to thank uh, the Aperio Foundation and Red Hat uh, for co-organizing uh, this with us. Um, the uh, next part of the, or the rest of the day, really, is going to be uh, discussions among folks in working in different areas or in different initiatives within education. So what we're hoping to do is, as Ian said, <clears throat> excuse me, really start a conversation um, in order to find similarities between often siloed uh, initiatives on campus. So what can the open textbooks people learn from the open source software people that they can learn from the uh, uh, open science and research folks. Um, so our first panel uh, is going to, uh, I'll introduce the moderator and let the moderator uh, introduce the panel. Um, so uh, uh, Ken Udis uh, is the, uh, I think he's got the longest title of everyone, anyone I know, but uh, Vice President of Academic Services, Services and Chief Information Officer at uh, Southern Queensland University uh, in Australia. So. I was going to say he traveled the furthest, but I saw Martin Dugamis is here, so I think he wins from Perth over. Yeah. Right. But uh, please welcome, please join me in welcoming Ken and the first panel. Thank you, Pat. Uh, one of the other things I'll mention is that Martin actually has an Australian accent. Um, I don't, so I think that even makes it more authentic. Uh, I'm going to get. Uh, out of the way and, and out from behind the podium as quickly as possible. I do just want to uh, set up a little bit what we're going to do and how it's going to flow. Uh, as I don't know any of the panelists as well as they know themselves, I'll ask them to very briefly introduce themselves. Um, what we're going to be doing is going in alphabetical order. We're going to be doing uh, 10 to 15 minute presentations. And then at the end, we'll open up the floor for discussion, questions, and so on. We'll be fielding it. And as, as Pat had suggested, there's two microphones right here. They might rove a little bit. Uh, and then there'll be others as well sort of collecting uh, tweets. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll if, if there's any threat of silence, we'll fill that that way. So uh, what I'd like to do is start um, from your left, from our right, with uh, Nicole. So would you like to just do a very quick introduction across? Sure. Uh, Nicole Allen, I'm director of open education for Spark, which is a library membership organization uh, working for an open system of scholarly communication. Thank you. Um, I'm Simon Hodgson, executive director of CoData. CoData stands for the Committee on Data for the International Council of Science. We're an offshoot of the International Council of Science that was set up um, some time ago to look after data issues, and really we're concerned with open data for the benefit of research. I'm New York City Council Member Ben Kalos. It's at Ben Kalos on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and GitHub. I uh, chair the Committee on Governmental Operations and uh, represent 168,000 people on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, Roosevelt Island, East Harlem, East Midtown, and my goal is to restore faith in government uh, by opening it and putting you back in charge. Thank you. I'm Margaret Mellinger from Oregon State University. I'm the Director of Emerging Technologies and Services in the libraries there. And it is said Oregon, not Oregon. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you for the introductions. Let's welcome the panel and uh, Nicole to start out. Thank you very much. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, it's exciting to be here. So as I mentioned, I work with an organization called Spark. Um, what we work to do is essentially make open the default in research and education. Um, and since we're here at the Open Summit, um, I thought I might focus some of my remarks on what is open? Um, what is the meaning of open? What does it mean to us? And I'll talk about it a little bit in the context of the next generation, give you a couple of examples. 
um, of how students and early career professionals and researchers are helping to advance this movement. Um, so openness, that's what we're all here for. We all come, appear to come from you know, different segments of it. You know, there's open education, there's open software, there's open access to research, there's open data, um, there's open government, and lots of different um, types of things that become open, and that's what we're talking about here. And um, each of our segments has its own definition of open. Um, but I think generally we all agree with the open definition um, from uh, open knowledge, which uh, describes any type of object that has these four qualities, so free access, um, free ability to use, legal ability to modify, and the permission to share um, with some or limited requirements. And you know, that's what we mean when we're talking about items, um, whether it's uh, you know, a textbook, um, or a data set, uh, or a research article. Um, but there's also open in terms of uh, uh, what it means as an environment. Um, and I like to describe it like this, that open is the state of nature in the digital world. Um, and this thought actually occurred to me the other day when I was talking to uh, one of my second cousins. She's, I think, 15 years old. Um, and I was telling her about what I do. I advocate for open educational resources, um, government policy that makes sure that when you know, taxpayers fund the development of educational resources or research or data sets, that those are released for the public for them to freely use. Um, and my cousin asked me, well, if they're digital, why aren't they free to use? Um, so I had to explain to her, uh, you know, copyright and why things aren't published that way because before the internet, before she was born, um, the way that we distribute, like the most efficient systems that we could define to distribute knowledge uh, were print-based um, scholarly publishers um, and academic publishers um, and, you know, uh, pages and pages of graph sheets with data on it. Um, and still our world operates with many vestigial policies and practices that you know, were, were developed for that world. And our world just hasn't caught up yet. Um, we still have a lot of the policies and practices and assumptions that are kind of left over from the analog world. And we're in this weird phase of transition between the two. And when I think about open, I think it really is the state of nature in the digital world, on the internet. It's the way it would be if there weren't all of those rules. Um, and I, I think that this is something, speaking as a, a millennial myself, um, somebody who grew up with the internet, I think this makes sense organically to us um, in a way that it doesn't automatically with uh, people who didn't grow up with the internet, and of course open isn't a generational issue, anybody can be an open ad advocate and part of Generation Open, but I think the future scholars and researchers and leaders of our world get this organically. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, as we think about what, what does the future of the academy look like, well, um, uh, there's a lot of frustrations right now in the transitions we're facing, um, but I think there's a time limit on it because the next generation is coming. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about two examples of how, um, in, in my career, I've worked with uh, uh, students um, and uh, young members of the academy to advance openness. Um, so the first is a campaign called the Textbook Rebellion, um, and this is actually a picture of when we stopped here at NYU. You may recognize the art. Um, and this is a campaign that was born out of the frustration with the rising cost of college textbooks. Um, I was working with the student public interest research group. So, you know, textbook prices have been rising out of control. I was actually just looking the other day at uh, Mancuse Economics, which is one of the, you know, most widely used intro economics textbooks in the U.S. It costs $399. And it, you could understand the economic forces behind why that happened if you can buy the book, but you can't because it's too expensive. Um, so it's crazy, and uh, you know, textbook prices have more than doubled since I started college in 2003. So um, this campaign was born out of frustration um, with the rising cost of textbooks and the fact that we have a solution today, uh, which is open educational resources and open textbooks, um, which are openly licensed, they're distributed for free, they're high quality, 
Um, and not only do they allow students the choice uh, to get a low-cost printed copy or, or read it for free online, but it also gives instructors the ability to adapt the material to make sure it's up to date. Mancuse economics, it is out of date the second it hits the shelves, and it's gonna be out of date forever because it's bound within printed pages and the digital editions have to match up with the printed version. Whereas with a born digital resource, that can be updated and adapted and made current for the students who are taking that course. Um, and this, this campaign went to 40 campuses across the US. We had a van and took these two mascot costumes representing a bad textbook and, and the good open textbook. Um, and we got ten, tens of thousands of students out to events. They signed petitions. Um, and by the end of it, uh, people were recognizing it when we walked on campus. Um, and this helped raise a ton of visibility for the idea of open educational resources, which you may have seen. Um, recently, the Obama administration came out um, in support of this with uh, Department of Education staff focused on it in a campaign designed to get our nation's schools to go open with open educational resources. Um, the other example I want to give is, is a project called OpenCon um, that my organization, Spark, uh, organizes every year. And this is a, a community built around an annual conference focused on students in early career uh, academics um, on the issues of open access, open education, and open data. And it was born out of this idea that, um, you know, to many people of uh, kind of the, 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 the people who grew up with the internet, we don't see uh, you know, open education and open access is two separate things. It's the same idea applied in two different ways. Um, and this conference and community is built around um, bringing together and activating and energizing members of the next generation um, to go home to their communities and help drive change. And amazing projects have come out of this. Um, for example, the open access button, which is a browser-based tool that allows you to actually, when you run into a research article that, that you can't access because it costs $30 on Elsevier, um, uh, you can actually click this button and it'll search for a, a free copy that's been archived in a library somewhere. Um, and there have been uh, campus-based efforts to develop um, open textbook advocacy programs. There's a crowdsourced open glossary um, that, that students from this developed. Um, so, you know, working to just kind of capture that energy and, and drive it forward. And we're gonna be holding OpenCon 2016 in uh, November in Washington, D.C. And as part of that, we're gonna do a full day advocacy day on Capitol Hill and in foreign embassies and, and with the Obama administration trying to drive this issue forward. Um, so I encourage you to check uh, that out. Um, and I'll note that the conference is, is by application only, but there are lots of ways to get involved in the community built around it. Um, so I wanna just close by coming back to this idea of open and the fact that it's the state of nature. And as we're starting to see more and more products and, and, and companies and and organizations and players step into the open space because it is cool, they recognize the potential. Um, we're also starting to see open washing in the same way that we started to see green washing happening around the environmental movement. And it brings me back to this idea of state of nature. Um, and as we're looking at the great projects um, and efforts that are, are developing in the open space, I think we need to be conscious of, you know, who's environmentally friendly uh, to the state of nature and who isn't and uh, encourage you to think you know, throughout the day and as you leave, um, you know, how, how can you be a good, uh, uh, how can you take care of nature in the open environment and how can you um, protect and preserve it um, and allow it to flourish the way that it wants to. Um, so I also just wanna, uh, as a final note, um, as an advocate for open for close to 10 years, uh, the thing I've realized is that it's not about open. It's about what open achieves, whether it's helping students get better access to education, whether it's about helping to discover knowledge or fuel innovation or improve our economy. Um, it's open in order to, not just open. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, 
as we said in our introductions, I'm Simon Hodgson, Executive Director of Codata. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Codata in a moment. Um, but first I want to really underline what the themes of my, my short presentation will be. I want to stress that open data, open data for research, open data produced by research, it's fundamental to research or science, science in the broad sense, in the 21st century. Research is increasingly data intensive. It's increasingly transdisciplinary. It addresses issues of major societal, economic, and environmental importance. And to do so, it needs access to data. And for verification, for trust in research, other researchers and the general public need access to those data as well. So that's one of the fundamental points that I will stress in the presentation and, and that underpins it. And I want to underline two imperatives as well. That this is international, that research is increasingly international. We know that. We've got an international participation in this room. And the questions that research addresses are international. And again, in order to do so, there's an imperative for open data and open science. And when I say science, I mean science in the Latin sense, scientia, in the German sense of Wissenschaft, not in this divisive Anglo-Saxon, the science and humanities. It's research, evidence-based study. And the other imperative is the education and training side. That education and training in open data, in open science, is imperative to the advancement of knowledge and to realizing the goals that we all strive for, for something like the, the, the open data state of nature that Nicole has mentioned. So those, those are the themes of the talk, and I'll do that by talking about a number of initiatives in which Codata is involved along, along with partners. Very briefly, Codata is the Committee on Data for the International Council of Science, as I mentioned. What, you might ask, is the International Council of Science? It's an organization that represents, on the one hand, science academies, so in this country, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, and on the other hand, international scientific unions. So they're the organization which represent a particular discipline or area of research internationally. And they have this umbrella body called the International Council of Science, which is the closest thing to representing that endeavor internationally. There are other organizations with which we collaborate that also do that, and I'll come on to that in a moment. So we were set up a long time ago, in 1966, by the International Council of Science to address data issues, data availability and data quality. And I'll not go into the history of CoData, we don't have time, but if you're ever interested, there's a, there's a history on, on our website and it's fascinating stuff. We have three priorities in our strategic plan. We advocate open data principles and policies and practices. We do that by producing advocacy reports into the economic benefits of, of, of open data for research. We advocate good practice in data policies. And we also, the second area of our, of our strategic priority is uh, frontiers of data science. So we look at some of the technical issues to do with data, data standards. We have a data science journal, and we organize a conference every two years. And I'll mention that later in the presentation. And we also do a lot of work. The third priority area of the strategy is capacity building, training in data, in data skills and open science. And I'll mention a bit of that as well. You may be familiar with this report, Science as an Open Enterprise. Although this came out in 2012, it's still intensely relevant, and it's a really a foundational report that has in, had a significant influence on government policies internationally and the data policies which have been adopted by funders and institutions, and therefore under which we work. Um, the lead author was Geoffrey Bolton, who's a fellow of the Royal, Royal Society, and is now president of, of Codata, which is partly why um, I mention this. That report, we have used a great deal to determine our strategy, to refine and focus our strategy, and it informs a lot of the work um, that, we, that we do going for, forward. It describes a landscape in which tr 
research has been transformed by the digital age and in which the practice of research needs to, needs to adapt. By taking advantage of technology and making the foundational underpinnings of research, the data, openly available. So in that context, I'll also mention very briefly a report from the UN expert um, adv advisory group to the, to the UN Se Se Secretary General on the data revolution. You may be aware of a thing called the S Sustainable Development Goals. This report lays out how open data is essential for achieving those goals and for monitoring and understanding our progress towards those goals. And it presents that challenge as an international one and underlines these points, which, which, I'll, which, I'll, which I'll, I'll stress. To meet the new, new sustainability goals, there's an urgent need to mobilize the data revolution for all people on the whole planet in order to monitor progress, to hold governments accountable, which Ben has mentioned, and to foster sustainable development. And it also stresses that we're in serious danger. The advance of research in developed countries, in economically developed countries, has been so great in the last 15 to 20 years, thanks to the internet age. We're in danger of widening the gap between those education and research systems and those which are less uh, well-funded. And it's important that we address that. So these sort of things inform the activities of CoData. Um, two years ago, we organized a re research, training, and policy workshop uh, in Kenya, hosted by the German Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology and by the UN um, Environmental Program. That workshop looked at a number of policy issues, particularly in um, lower and middle income countries, and we were very grateful to have participated in that meeting, um, the Kenyan Cabinet Secretary, Fred Matiangi, who called on international organizations to do more to address open data issues and the inequalities um, in realization of the benefits of open data internationally. And that workshop led directly to a, the establishment of a center of excellence in open science at, at, at that university. So that's just an example of the sort of work that we do. We've been working with them subsequently on their, on their data policies and training issues. I also wanted to mention this report as an example of, of the work we do, and there's a little pile of them if you're interested in them in the back of the room. Um, this report was for a collaboration that, that was led by the International Council of Science called Science International with other organizations that represent science research internationally. And CoData was asked to lead it to present a case for open data, to present a set of principles and then to ask for their endorsement by these organizations and their constituent parts. And so that report lays out a framework, lays out a set of principles and the case for open data and the sort of things that I've been mentioned, why this is important for the advancement of research. As I said, the, the report's at the back of the room and you can read it in more detail, but we would ask and we are inviting from educational organizations, from open, from organizations that advocate open, whether that's in education or software or research to endorse the report, to endorse the accord and, and to support activities that come from it. One of those activities is a capacity building activity in Southern Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the report was launched at a meeting called um, Science Forum South Africa last December and this December, we hope to be able to announce a capacity building activity in, in, in South Africa, in Southern Africa rather, beyond, beyond South Africa, with funding and support from um, the Department of Science and Technology in, in, in South Africa. So the sort of things that that activity will address are data policies, which must underpin this environment of science as an open enterprise. How do we work with research systems and organizations and universities in sub-Saharan Africa to adopt data policies and to implement them in a way that's beneficial for those research systems. So this co-design of data policies. Address incentive frameworks so that people are rewarded for making data available. And the training activities which, which we do and the infrastructure roadmap. 
So I'll close the presentation just a couple of minutes, I think, with a brief mention of our training activities. We look at syllabi, at curricula internationally, and we argue that there's need for greater emphasis on skills around the use and reuse of data. So I'll just stress this for a moment. Contemporary research, this is what, what, what I've underlined already, particularly when addressing the most significant transdisciplinary research challenges, increasingly depends upon a range of skills to do with data. These skills include the principles and practice of open science, adapting to the new way in which research is done, research data management. I'm sure a lot of your universities are increasingly running courses on how to look after data. The development of a range of data platforms and infrastructures, how to use them, how to fire up a virtual machine, techniques of large-scale analysis and statistics, visualization, modeling techniques, software development, how to use GitHub, etc., and data annotation. These are the skills that all researchers need in the 21st century. And currently, they're not really being addressed in curricula. Now, what we propose is a short course, which researchers, research support staff, trainers come along to, to get an insight in some of these, uh, some of these, these skills. So it looks at, I'll, I'll not run through that curriculum again, but these are the sort of things on the slide that, that, that it addresses. We've taken a lot from the, are you familiar with software carpentry and data carpentry? I'm sure some of you are involved in those, those initiatives. This is a form of open education. You make the, the materials open as open educational resources, you accredit the tutors, and you rerun and remix the course elsewhere. So this is what we're trying to do with this international course in data skills in what we're calling research data science. We've got a node school which happens every year in Trieste in Italy at the International Center of Theoretical Physics, and then will have spin-off schools internationally. And so the first of these schools is happening at that site um, in Trieste um, in, in August, and we'll be spinning that off in 2017 in other locations, and we'll be very keen to have collaborators on that. I'm going to wrap up now. We have a conference coming up in Denver, Colorado, International Data Week. Please look, look that up. It's internationaldataweek.org. As part of that, there's our conference, which is a research conference on data issues, SciDataCon. Um, the URL is, is there if you want to find out more. And to close, we're very keen to talk to participants in this room about collaboration. And I'll leave with the, the issue that I think um, um, Margaret's going to come on, on to, which is also the need to address the incentives for open in the academic se sector and reward for making data available and for doing things in an open um, and doing things in the right way. Thank you very much. Good morning. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Everyone's a little bit more awake. I'm Council Member uh, Ben Kalos. I'm a free and open source software developer that somehow got elected to the City Council in New York. Thank you. And uh, I know that some of you have already gotten it, but you can really tweet me, Facebook me, Instagram me, or hit my GitHub repository at Ben Kalos, B-E-N-K-A-L-L-O-S. I actually have my legislation posted there a little bit before an NYU professor named Clay Shirky did a TED talk on it. I actually put all of my policies and legislation and proposals on GitHub. And uh, we have a future that we now live in where at least one legislature, legislator out there has legislation you can push and pull and update. Um, now, as we start talking a lot about technology, I do want to mention how important it is to not leave anyone behind because of the digital divide. And being sensitive to that, I'm very tech savvy and I'm really out there, but I also do things that are important. I do a first Friday every single month, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., where I meet with constituents about whatever they want. I do a policy night for constituents who don't want to interact through Git or another uh, technocratic uh, 
tool, and they can just meet with me face to face and talk about legislative ideas that they might have. And uh, last but not least, for any one of my constituents who's willing to get 10 people together, I do a Ben in your building, where I actually just show up and talk about whatever that building's needs are. And as long as you're able to do that piece, you will get what you need in order to do some of the more tech-centric pieces, but it also means that you keep your feet planted on the ground and you're not leaving anyone behind. Uh, so before I was in the council as an advocate for open data, since I've been in the council, I've been able to pass open legislation, open law, open records, open budget uh, is a bill I introduced, which has already been implemented by the mayor. We also have an open FOIL portal, which has been implemented. Some pieces that are on my stack to get done is an open source software preference for the city of New York. Uh, we spend billions of dollars a year on software procurement, and imagine if we were using that in open. Along those lines, uh, what if people actually knew what we were spending our contracting on? So I'll be working on something called open contracting. And uh, last but not least, open engagement. What if we actually had an API for engaging government? And one piece I've actually been holding off on is uh, open textbooks. I would love to introduce legislation on that. We have 1.1 million kids in our public schools, and what if we spent the money that we would be spending on textbooks on giving them a laptop or a tablet so that they could engage their materials and use that cost savings? And the best piece of it is we have people from all over the world in this city, and we could actually have textbooks that are tailored to the children. My one hesitation, and I'll ask the academia folks in this room, is I've seen a lot of research around retention deficiencies using electronic media, and I don't know if it's because of the population we're testing, uh, that being uh, the, the college student and uh, a certain generation of college students not having grown up with that versus uh, others, but uh, that's the only thing that's holding me up on that piece which is kind of rare. So I wanted to talk a little bit about open advocacy. Politics is a part of every organization, whether we like it or not. Uh, the part of my job I hate the most is actually the politics of it, and I'm a professional politician. Uh, but within each organization, you have trust frameworks. In government, elected officials uh, have a trust framework with one another. And once one elected official does something, that creates trust and others might follow. The access I had as an advocate to elected officials is dwarfed by the fact that I am now one myself, which means we're stuck locked in a room very often, and uh, I get to advocate whenever I want. Within academia, you have the same trust frameworks amongst administrators, amongst faculty, uh, and even amongst your graduate students and undergraduates. Undergraduates say, which, which class do I want to take? Where is the easy A? Uh, for the graduate students, which professor is going to be the best mentor, help me get published? And uh, similarly around for faculty and uh, administration, what are the policies we need to make? And uh, in that way, the same way that we listen to friends and colleagues, uh, which Facebook has marvelously capitalized on, is within your organization. So within your organization, there may be only one of you. And that is why this room has people from all over the planet, but uh, it is not brimming with 50 people from each and every single campus. So assuming that many of you are one of the single advocates, hopefully you are a trusted internal advocate. And one piece to remember from physics is that uh, observation changes the observed. When you bounce an electron or a photon off something, it impacts it. And uh, so you just being there will hopefully change what's happening in that room. And when there is an advocate within a trust framework, uh, you can advocate internally for governance and policy changes towards openness. Uh, in large part, one of the best tools you may have is amending a larger document and uh, adding in that piece that you specifically want. In Congress, they call that pork barrel spending. Here, you can use it for your own advantage of, hey, there's this bigger piece. Maybe if I add a couple of words or this one sentence, it might have a larger scope. And so in that, you can be the change you wish to see in the world, which is something Mahatma Gandhi uh, once said. But along those same lines, I do have to caution you. Uh, and, and so th there's a back and forth. So the great thing about being the change is uh, you are your own organization. There is no board of directors. You get to make the decision. Uh, and uh, you're the sole decision maker. But it also means you have to be the model. And uh, you can be the model of the change you wish to see but you have to have the courage to live by what you believe, and that can be very scary. 
I'm a huge freedom of information uh, law advocate, and so when somebody foils my schedule, I, I give them my entire schedule. Uh, my attorneys say that I don't have to tell them where I go on dates, so they write a horrible piece in the newspaper about me because I didn't tell them where I wanted a date with my wife. Um, apparently that's protected. I, I think it should be too. But um, you have to live by that, and that means making tough decisions every day. But I'll say that probably one of the very few negative pieces on me there. Uh, now, in terms of it, you can do it as a single advocate. You can also build coalitions. Uh, one piece is you can just do it through nuisance value. Uh, so nuisance value, you are the advocate, you are asking for this one sentence, and if they give you this one sentence, you'll go away and they can move on with their lives. Uh, that's not the best place to be, but it is a place to be. You can also work on changing hearts and minds and trying to find, cultivate, and work with like-minded individuals in your organization, build a coalition on that one sentence or that policy that you're hoping for, and uh, see what you can do. You can also try to do it from externally. Uh, you can go to advocates and organizations in your localities and try to bring them in, uh, or organizations like this, and saying, hey, I, I drafted this, we'd love to have your sign on, your endorsement for this policy that I'm putting forward. Uh, you can also work to recruit like-minded individuals. In the city council in New York, we had a progressive caucus. They had 12 members. They then spent a lot of time recruiting other members, getting them to run, bringing them into the city council, and now we have 18 members, a much more progressive body, a progressive mayor, progressive speaker. You are your organization, and if you change the membership thereof, it can also change the organization. And uh, the reality is if you're not doing it, somebody else is. Now, in terms of open systems, I'm going to transition for the advocacy to the systems piece. Democracy should be open. But even in New York City, where we have open data, there is a disconnect between policy experts, you, and policymakers, me. And uh, that starts at the very groundwork of open frameworks. They're uh, different, and they're data siloed, as uh, Ken uh, referred to in his opening. Policy experts organize around specific disciplines with conferences and publications attended and read within their specific discipline. Policymakers attend conferences with other policymakers and often special interests, with our publications being the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Daily News, the New York Post, for better or for worse, or mainstream media. Uh, couldn't be any different. My challenge to open education is for policy experts to become the consumers of the government's open data, using it to study and understand existing conditions, then put forth and test hypotheses to inform better public policy for policymakers. Here's the scared straight moment. Government has no IRB. Our legislation and law is nothing more than hypotheses tested in the real world on real people with real outcomes which are rarely studied. It is government often by special interests rather than the scientific method. When I've said the word scientific method in policy discussions, I've gotten laughs from my colleagues, yes. So just one instance is I introduced legislation, I call it the Healthy Happy Meals legislation. It would uh, make sure to, uh, make, it would limit uh, when you provide incentives to children, making sure that the food would actually be healthy. Dr. Brian Elbel at NYU studied and published in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine whether or not it would have a positive outcome. I have never read the American Journal of Preventative Medicine. But one thing he did is he also got it into Forbes, which is something I did read and then the rest of the country read, and he proved that it would have a positive outcome. And so if that can be an example of get it into your journal, but then get it into my journal, get it into something that policymakers will see. Now, also policy experts must demand that data is relevant. You have to audit the data that isn't relevant and help improve the data sources. Policymakers and experts must be open, responsive to requests, as well as reorient away from fear of uncovering problems that could reflect poorly. 
So that means when you publish something, put out your data set. Be open data in your own studies. Also, the government needs to be the same way. Uh, one of the biggest concerns from anyone who's governing is that somebody might uncover a mistake. So the other challenge for policy experts is to not only uncover the problems, but show up and work with policymakers to find solutions. And then, once you have the solution in hand, you have an amazing case study for publishing in academic journals and mainstream media of, here's a problem, we identified it, we found a solution, we tested it, and uh, now the problem is fixed. That's a much better story if you can get the media to cover it, that people are actually doing something right. Additionally, policy experts must study legislation before it becomes law and share in the language that policymakers understand, which is a memorandum in support, providing expert testimony and publishing in journals and mainstream media where the elected officials are looking. Now, like the uh, student that I think all of you have had who says, will this be on the final exam? Policy experts must add as a measure of success for tenure or other rewards, studies, memorandum, and testimony provided to policymakers at every level of government. What impact has your research had on public policy and making the world a better place? quite a bit shorter. Um, I'm Margaret Mellinger. I'm from Oregon State University, and I'm the Director of Emerging Technologies and Services in the Libraries. And today I'm going to talk about how libraries can contribute to the open source movement by adopting open source software. So open source software in libraries. Maybe people don't know for sure that uh, libraries are changing quite a bit in the last, oh, 20 years for sure, probably longer. Um, this is a picture of the Boston Public Library, which kind of shows the history and ethic of how libraries have this grounding in free to all. We're the place that is welcoming to everyone, where you can share and learn. And this sort of um, ethic is also available in the open source community, which is really kind of the underpinning of the open source community, of having that free to all idea. Library principles are pretty similar in some ways to open source principles. So access to information is a public good. Libraries are bias-free, welcoming places. Libraries are an intellectual commons where people can learn new knowledge and contribute knowledge back to the uh, institution. OSS principles, open source software principles, free re redistribution, um, open source code, um, making derived works and re, re, um, resubmitting those to the community of coders and integrity of that source code uh, so that you know the authority of the people that are creating it and also no discrimination against persons or groups. These are very common kinds of principles. They're common values of community, collaboration, sharing, intellectual freedom, and equitable access. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the types of library open source applications that have been popular in libraries in the last few years. The first is institutional repositories. And that sounds rather dry, but it's a really exciting thing because it's a place where we are capturing the intellectual output of our, of our communities and our institutions, and we're making it openly available to the world. So this is a, a place where we might put theses and dissertations, um, research papers, preprints, data, and other kinds of um, objects. Um, digital asset management systems are the places where we're sharing our collections of images and documents and um, things that are historical and unique and archival. We're also um, using digital preservation systems that are open source in order to um, be able to preserve those digital objects that we're creating and collecting 
and that we uh, want to move forward into the future so that we um, are replicating them and we're migrating them to new formats as, their, as formats change. Another thing that people may not realize is that libraries are um, into publishing, and um, that means we are um, doing um, open source journals, open access, I mean open access journals, excuse me, and we're also having uh, different kinds of supplemental material, perhaps in blogs. I'm going to show you a, a few of the, just a few of the examples of these kinds of things. So, DSpace at MIT is an example of an institutional repository, and it's one of the early ones. It started in 2003 um, when uh, Hewlett Packard and MIT had a collaboration to create this institutional repository. Um, a, a different kind of repository is this digital asset management system from WGBH called Open Vault, and they are providing um, a way to, for the uh, public to see some of their rich media sources from the history that they have collected over the years. Um, this is an open access journal that's peer reviewed. Uh, Blake, an illustrated quarterly, is hosted on the open journal systems platform and it's um, hosted by the University of Rochester Libraries. At our own institution, we recently published a book called The Photographic History of Oregon State University. Um, in, in advance of our 150th um, anniversary. And this um, is, this is um, called Scalar. This is a um, augmented, it's an, a supplemental material that was published. All the um, images that we had in the book wouldn't all fit. So they took the extra images that didn't fit in the book and they put them on Scalar, which is an open source platform for publishing images and text and it's um, uh, hosted at USC. These are just some of the top um, sorts of open source software that libraries like to use. Fedora Commons, Hydra, Blacklight, DSpace, Open Journal Systems. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Hydra because that's one of the um, open source software communities that my library is involved in. And um, Hydra is an open source platform that was developed, um, in two, started in 2008, and it um, has uh, quite a lot of partners. Where there are 30 of us now, and so um, those partners are working together to do um, various things. It's uh, Hydra is um, an institutional repository that has many heads. So those of you that know your um, mythology will realize why we might have called it Hydra. Um, it's used across the country, across the world, I mean, and in, in various places, and this is, um, this is just a map of those. So I'm gonna um, just skip forward a little bit. There's some challenges that open source software has um, uh, for libraries adoption, and um, some of those things are People are worried that they don't have enough people in the library that understand how to do coding. They don't have, they need ex, ex, expertise and um, access to servers that they might not have. Um, they're worried about documentation, uh, which might not have kept up with the most recent version. They need software support. Um, and they also um, might be worried about the, the code not being up to snuff. So some, some of the benefits of open source software can, can address those challenges. So with Hydra, um, sharing is a really huge uh, benefit because there's a shared governance of the whole project and there are lots of different pieces of it. So all that governance is shared across 30 institutions and all the, the work gets shared across in, in all of those places. There's also shared code. Um, in Hydra, there's a a group of expert coders who are who vet all of the code that are that is um, submitted by a group of people, so that the code can be verified and quality assured. Um, the shared work across all of those institutions means that um, although I only have four programmers in my library, they're part of a group of 180 programmers over the whole project. So we can leverage and um, build capacity within our libraries. Flexibility, um, open source 
softwares um, easily developed using agile programming methods. Um, this particular software is built with Ruby on Rails. We use GitHub. We are um, working together and um, doing sprints. And there's a basis of code, so there's a core set of uh, code that, um, that everyone can use, but then people can build on that code and it's extendable to make it um, work for your local institution. And I know I've said this before, but community is really what the strength of open source software is. That's what makes it sustainable and what makes it maintainable. Um, I'm sorry, I went back, went back too far. So we have these shared values. We have all of these people in the same room. We meet together. Um, we have different ways of communicating together. We are on GitHub, Slack. We use IRC. We have a wiki. We have a lot of different levels of communication that we can um, create with each other, and um, we can ensure quality outcomes. Um, I think it's Linus's law that says, many eyes make all bugs shallow. These are um, some of the many eyes that are working with the Hydra project, and they're the people that are broadening and boosting the ability for Hydra to create a common success. Thank you. I do want to thank the panel. Everyone uh, kept to a, well, kept to time, which was fantastic. What that's done, though, is uh, allowed us to be able to take some time. I think we've got someplace around 20 minutes for um, some uh, discussion and questions. I'm going to refrain. I know that while I was listening, I've, I've got a list of questions and observations. I'm not going to intercede at all. Um, so why don't we, we've got uh, two microphones here. Does anyone, would anyone like to, um, uh, sort of ask a question. Well, Excellent. If I may. Um, oh, would you like to ask a question? If it's okay. I was watching Twitter, and there were a couple of comments about my talk, and if I, I'd just like to quickly clarify a couple of things. Um, <laughs> Some vindication, okay. <laughs> what? Oh, no, good. Sorry. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that just because students and young people grew up with the internet, it does not mean that they have access to it or that they know how to effectively use it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, open makes sense you know, as a default because there has, they don't, they didn't grow up with other options. Um, and uh, our world continually imposes restrictions that, you know, prevent openness. Um, it's no wonder students don't like digital e-textbooks because they tend to be like flat PDFs, so they can't um, keep them forever because they self-destruct because of DRM, um, and they can't interact with them. Um, and I also want to underscore the point that the idea of, you know, just understanding open isn't generational. Um, I said that before, it can be anybody, but it is the younger generations that, you know, parts of the analog world just don't make sense to us. Um, and as the leaders of tomorrow, we are going to push for open. And the question is whether the leaders of today are going to help prepare the world for that. And that includes information literacy, and that includes making sure that our systems for sharing knowledge are open so that we can really use the internet for what it was built for, which is to benefit and improve society. Fantastic. Thank you, Nicole. Um, would anyone like to either follow up on any of those points, ask a question? We've got a gentleman here. Uh, Nicole, Simon, Ben, and Margaret, thanks for uh, taking the time. Um, I would uh, ask if you could talk about some successful strategies to get buy-in for openness, whether it's within academia or science or, or government, uh, something that could apply to uh, the four of you. Thanks a lot. So on one level, I, I provided one in the work that we've done in Kenya. Um, so that's a university. Now, there are, there are issues, as, as I hinted, in countries where the research base is less well-funded. And there is a concern in many of those countries that open data is just another form of, you know, and I'll, I'll use the word, word of post-colonialism of, of ex resource extraction. We make data here, we study agriculture, and then we make it open, and other people will take their data and they will use it. Now, how do you overcome that resistance and, and say that actually 
the open data world, the open science world, will benefit your research base far more than protection. And that's not necessarily an easy case to make. But it's one that we tried to do in that policy workshop, and specifically in working with the university that we're working with in Kenya. And they see that as adopting open, as the modus operandi for their university, as an advantage. They will get that first starter advantage and other places will have to catch up. And so that's setting up a center of excellence in open science. They believe gives them an advantage, it gets attention for their university, it attracts students and researchers. But we need to test that, you know, whether their strategy will be right. We think it will, and we think it's working. But it's working with a, an institution like that to explore those benefits and to encourage them to take them. Thank you, I, Simon. Um, go ahead, Ben. Sure. I want to take this question and also respond to a tweet from at VTE Live, which was asking, who is, uh, if, if I'm referring to myself as one of us, who is them? And so on the other side of your question, on the other side of open, uh, is them. Them are special interests. Those are the vendors who have been making millions, billions, or more for as long as anyone can remember, uh, being the owners of our information, of our research, of our laws. Uh, the framework that worked for me in New York on making our laws and legislation open was the uh, vendor in question, whether they were being blamed by the administration or they were, in fact, uh, was uh, against this idea of making our legislation and laws open because that would undermine their business model. Uh, what I ended up doing is, because I could not find internal advocates with whom to work, is I built them, I found them. So I, much like a conference like this, uh, when you come back to your organization and say, well, uh, I'm gonna screw up the name, but Oregon, perfect. <laughs> uh, Oregon's doing it and uh, Wales is doing it and all these other people are doing it, we should do it too, otherwise we're going to be the last. Uh, all of a sudden people have courage because no one wants to be first unless there's a race and in that case, you want to be first. So by building a, uh, a framework, building a coalition of people in other institutions all over this planet, you can create pressure, even if it's just eight of you or 10 of you on a phone call once a month saying, hey, where are you, how are you doing? And if each of you is able to have this conspiracy for openness, uh, you can create pressure because, hey, I heard another institution is doing this. Do you really want to be behind that institution? Thank you, Ben. Is there any, are there any additional, Nicole? Briefly, I, I think it's always important as an open advocate to remember that open is a means, not an end. Um, and it's about convincing the people you want to convince that open is good for them and will achieve their goals, um, not just trying to achieve open for open's sake. Great, thank you. Um, thank you very much. We're, we're happy to take other questions. Margaret, did you have anything to say along those? I just have a very practical thing to add. Um, at Oregon State, um, and then very many other universities as well, I think Harvard might have been the first, we have um, an open access policy where we're um, not mandating that faculty um, um, submit their research to our institutional repositories, but we're encouraging that. And we give anyone a waiver who, who needs one, but we're encouraging that as an idea that um, more people will read your work if it's freely available. And the Faculty Senate agreed and they passed the open access policy a few years ago. Fantastic, thank you. I will, uh, I just want to mention something and maybe it's just something to, to sort of put a, a pin in for later or whatever the case may be. Simon's point about cultural appropriation I think is really, really important. I think that it's the flip side of a lot of the dialogue that we have in regard to sort of a commitment or faith in openness and transparency. And then there's, a, there's, there's that reciprocal sort of notion around respect for identity that comes along with that. Uh, I, ap I appreciate that point, thank you. Um, please? Yeah, it's been uh, implicit so far, I think, but uh, maybe so, someone among you can uh, tease out the uh, benefit of open for learning itself. Right? Sounds obvious, but we can tease it out. Okay, benefit of openness for learning. Would any of the panelists like to try? <laughs> Excellent, Simon. Yeah. So, 
someone spoke, uh, it, was, it was the keynote, about trust, trust in the students, and really treating people as adults, as learning individuals who will explore their own roots and learn from themselves. And I think that understanding of human nature, if you like, and what in what environment human nature, uh, humans thrive is fundamental to the open approach. Mm -hmm. So it's an open approach to learning and an open approach to the collaborative activity which is teaching and learning or whatever, whatever term we're, we're, we're using there. Um, one of the real success stories of open data in the research area for open research data is making data sets open for students to use, not regarding this as something that you only get onto when you're a fully fledged PhD or, a, or an academic, but undergraduates looking at the social values data set or demography data sets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and using that real data. So I guess those are the, mm -hmm. the, those, those are the two answers. There's the sort of the attitudinal one, open learning, and there's the availability of those resources at an early point in people's careers. Thank you, Simon. Ben? Without openness, there, there is almost, it, it's very difficult to have learning. As an elected official, I try to learn about topics on which I'm trying to legislate. And uh, what more often than not can happen is uh, I will do the research and whatever's available freely and openly on the internet. And then, like you, I'll be reading an article, and it will cite another article, and I'll find that point poignant, and I'll want to pursue it, and then I'll search for that article and get as far as I can until I hit the paywall. And once I hit the paywall, then it's a question of, uh, can I access this information to help me make better public policy? And uh, then the next step is, OK, is there a uh, academic research tool that I have access to as a government official, and the answer is usually not. Then the next question is, okay, how much is a uh, subscription? Usually a lot. And then the next question is to sit down with my staff and say, which one of you do I need to fire so I can subscribe to this academic journal so I can find that out, which then becomes we shouldn't fire anyone, which then says, okay, the, the things that are on the, the open side of the paywall are part of policy making and uh, what most of the world is seeing and the stuff on the other side of the paywall, I don't know who is accessing. Fantastic. Would Can anyone else like to? So this no? isn't directly on your question, but that provided the perfect opening to bring up a topic <laughs> that we haven't discussed yet and somebody mentioned on Twitter, so I'm going to do it now. Um, so open access to research. So a lot of the research that you're likely trying to access has been funded yeah. with taxpayer dollars. Yeah. So we as taxpayers are funding the development of research. Um, to benefit society, yet that's being published behind paywalls, and the people who are creating policy in our country can't access it. Um, it's crazy. And there's been a lot of progress in the policy sphere toward opening that up. The Obama administration has taken a few critical steps, um, and there's still a lot more that, that we can do to make sure that, that all the, the outputs of research are truly open. And there's a certain morality around the use of public funds and double dipping and all of that. I would like to very, very quickly, just, just for a moment, is that I know that the responses here around education and learning, a lot of it had to do with access. Um, I, I think that, it's, that in part, underneath all of that is, is opportunity. So it really starts becoming incumbent upon informal settings for an educator, a teacher, to be able to think about, about the types of things that they want to have learners develop, and that may very well be reflection, critical reasoning. It may very well be different ways, aggregation, uh, whatever the in synthesis and open access to open resources allows all of those sorts of things to be much more easily um, done and legally done. So I just wanted to put that in there because of uh, the question specifically about learning and teaching and facilitation. Uh, would anyone like to uh, respond or continue on where Nicole was going with uh, the research question or the or the public funding question or whatever? Okay. Well, really, really just to mention that one of the foundational documents of this is something that um, um, CODATA had a big input into as well, the OECD Statement of Principles on access, public access to data produced by publicly funded research. 
Now, it's a snappy title. We could have done better with that. But that document was produced in uh, 2007 and has, has had a huge influence on open research data policies internationally, whether that's the OSTP memo in this country or the, um, what the European Commission calls the Horizon 2020 program of research, the data policy that underpins that. And that has really, tr that, that statement of principles from the OECD, which obviously is an in, in influential organization, has had a significant influence on the way research is conducted and the principles under, under which research is, is conducted. We're a long way there from putting those principles into practice because a lot of the mandates have been unfunded and universities are undergoing a major transition in the culture of research and I think I know we've got to take another, uh, another question, but this might be another area of discussion. How do we transition from those obstacles, those principles, into a world of open, and how do we encourage the incentives that we need for academic researchers, for institutions, to act in a more open way to achieve the benefits that Nicole's talked about? Fantastic, great, great questions to follow up on. We have a question? Yeah, I think this is mostly directed at Nicole, but uh, maybe a bit to Simon as well. Uh, I think there's a thing that needs to be addressed sort of head on when one advocates in, for a state of nature, which is that humanity left a state of nature for good reasons. And uh, the, the question that, that I would address to you is, how does the, how do in the open world that you advocate do you envision the creators being con uh, paid for what they do. The, in, in open source, in some of the uh, domains in which open has been successful, there are models of the kind that we heard this morning you know, for Red Hat. The creators are, are sort of paid as an offshoot of some other activity. But in not every case is that likely to work, it seems to me. And in particular, uh, we can look at journalism, we can look at music, where the level of, of, of compensation that the creators are getting is going down as a consequence of the state of nature coming back, you know, where people don't actually pay for the creativity that they consume directly or even indirectly because advertising, in the case of journalism, no longer supports journalists, but actually more goes to indexers or other third parties who aren't directly paying for the, uh, the creators and likewise music as well. How does one avoid those things while holding true to your vision of this as a state of nature? And isn't it possible, speaking as a, uh, as a baby boomer, that those old folks actually had something on it by the artificial scarcity that was created by the technology actually having this beneficial side effect of requiring the creators to get paid in order for the creation to happen. And I, I just want to mention, since I mentioned Simon, I think this is closely related to what you're finding in Africa, that these guys put their data up and some drug company makes a drug and makes all the money off of the data that they put on the open web and didn't thereby get anything from. So the scarcity that one has to contemplate isn't the scarcity of distribution anymore, but there's still a scarcity of creation, that that always takes something. And we, where's the, how do you then proceed to focus the payments to the people who are doing the creating? So thank you for that uh, critique. And I think it, it, it does bring up an interesting point about um, the state of nature. Um, and I think perhaps an element that I didn't intend, which is that open has to be like the state of nature, which I think is wrong. I think like the state of nature in nature, we're figuring out what kind of structures and systems need to be in place to ensure a, you know, a productive and healthy environment um, in the open, in the internet. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean um, everyone for himself. Uh, I think that, you know, especially in, in the research arena, attribution requirements are absolutely critical to make sure that researchers are credi credited for the right work they do, and the same with authors. Um, so I think we do need to figure out models and structures um, that, that do provide boundaries 
um, within the open space, and that's very much developing. But I think it is false to say that the, the ways that that work are gonna be the same in the digital environment as they were in the print world, because we can see that that is not working. And trying to impose scarcity in a world that is plentiful um, is just, um, it's not gonna work. And we've already seen that. And I think it's about trying to figure out what models can support teachers and can support the producers and creators of knowledge. Um, and we are at a tra tra transitional time and I can't give you a specific answer for every different channel um, of, of types of creators, but I think we as a society, if we value creation, we need to find those ways. Um, and I think there are a lot of really interesting examples in the educational space. Um, and I think the academy is going to play a critical role in that um, in terms of owning and supporting and sustaining high quality educational resources that are brought within the academy, maybe not existing without of it. Okay, we've got about two minutes. Would you, um, Ben and then Simon? Uh, and that's for Simon. Well, I, I just wanted, wanted to come back to, the, to the, the, the comment that was made. So there's a very famous example of the Indonesian government refusing to share um, the, uh, the data that they had on the I think it was the H1N1 uh, uh, flu, flu virus, um, precisely because they didn't want that then to be used to sell, um, to sell them expensive um, um, and, and anti antiviral drugs. So that is a very real concern, and I alluded to that um, uh, when I mentioned um, you know, the, the accusations of, of neocolonialism and, and resource extraction in terms of data. Um, so I think the best we can do is provide counterexamples to that concern of how education and open data and open science benefits research institutions in all countries and the better resourced institutions in developed countries and the worst resourced institutions in developed countries or, or elsewhere. And the example I'll, get, I'll fall back on again is, is the one that we're working with in, in, in Kenya. There's an international network called the Global Open Data for Agriculture Network, GoDan. And they've got a really nice report which they did with the Open Data Institute in, in, in the UK, which provides a host of examples of the in situ use of open data to advance agriculture in various countries, and particularly in Kenya. And this is something that the Kenyan government is particularly keen on, that the dependency upon genetically modified drugs, uh, uh, crops, or on on, on fertilizers and pesticides can be reduced through the use of in situ open data so that farmers on the ground can adapt their, their approach to farming outside of those of that, of, of that buy-in to, 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 those, to those products. So you can make adaptations which will improve productivity because you know more about the soil, you know more about the weather, you know more about other things which will, will affect productivity. So it's the, as I said, the in situ use of open data which can reduce that dependency upon expensive um, Western approaches to, um, to agriculture. Great, we're, we're, we might be doing violence to the schedule very soon. Um, ben, if you just have a, a less, second. Less than 30 seconds. Uh, I'm a free and open source software developer. What I can say is we need to reframe the compensation models. So instead of I created a, a piece of knowledge, a piece of intellectual property, and I'm going to make pr money on that one idea I had once for the rest of my life. That is something we need to move past. What we've gotten to is an expert framework situation where uh, your value is based on your expertise and moving forward. I'm also an attorney, kept that a little bit secret, but uh, the more expertise you have, the quicker you can come up with an answer, the more elegant your code, the uh, better your research, the more likely people are to want to work with you. Uh, one th I, I am working on automatic benefits. Uh, one of the people at the front of this is Diana Pierce at the University of Washington. I'm giving her $20,000 from the city of New York to work on creating an open framework around her self-sufficiency calculator. And uh, that is a, a payment moving to her for her expertise because she is the leader in the country. If I could spend it here in New York, I would, but that's where she is. So. As people become experts, as people are the one that is being cited, that is being gone to, there is more value because you have less time and we spend more to get to it. And then your students and everyone just wants you to be there. So I think within the framework, uh, you end up making 
your money, you get your compensation based on your expertise and based on your added value beyond your initial idea. Thank you, Ben. That touches on the motivation component of it. I know that Margaret must have something to say. No? Okay, I was going to give you the last word. Uh, thank you very much. We really appreciate the camp. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Lunch is in the John Ben Snow Room on the third floor. You can get there by both elevator and escalator. John Ben Snow Room on the third floor. Just remember, it's a bit Game of Thrones. Thank you. So, my concern so, is yeah, literally... No, no, it's okay. Thank you. I'm really yeah. concerned.